Today's video is sponsored by NordVPN. Start protecting your internet experience today with 77% off a three-year plan by using code NerdSoup at nordvpn.com nerdsoup. Now this is a product that I'm very excited to share with you guys. If you're unfamiliar with VPNs, their basic function is to protect your information while you're online. Like how a firewall protects the information on your computer, a VPN protects your information when you're surfing the web. When I'm online, I don't want my private information to be up for grabs. I take my online privacy very seriously, so having a secure and reliable VPN is something that's very important to me. And if you feel the same way, you should definitely check out NordVPN. It's a product that I've been using for a little over a year now. It's one of the most highly touted VPNs in the world, and it's the only VPN to get a perfect score from PC Mag, and for good reason. NordVPN allows you to access an online private network so that you can share information remotely through public networks. NordVPN uses military-grade encryption to secure your data while connected to the internet. So things like your IP address, banking information, private passwords will all be secured and safe. NordVPN has thousands of superfast servers in over 60 countries around the world, and they have an extremely user-friendly interface that allows you to instantly connect to their online networks. They also have Android and iOS apps to help you secure your mobile browsing experience, and when you sign up for NordVPN, you can have six simultaneous connections. Secure the data on your computer, your laptop, your phone, your tablet, and you still have two more devices left. Best of all, there is no data logging, only data protection. You hear that, Facebook? So start protecting your internet experience with 77% off a three-year plan by using code NerdSoup at www.nordvpn.com NerdSoup. Hello there, NerdSoup fans. We are back revisiting every episode of Game of Thrones in anticipation. Anticip you good? And Tisha, what? Want to start this one over or? Hello there, NerdSoup fans, and we're here reviewing every episode of Breaking Bad in anticipation of the prequel <laughs> Better Call Saul coming back this autumn. <laughs> I'm here with the NerdSoup monkey. Hey, Aaron, how you doing? Great. I'm going to stop calling you the NerdSoup monkey, just monkey, you know? Or just Aaron, <laughs> you know? <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> A Man Without Honor, this episode begins with Theon waking up and realizing that the Stark boys have escaped. And what did I say last episode? His biggest weakness is his cock. So Ramsey did him a favor. Because him sleeping with Osha allowed the Stark boys to escape. His boy wasn't really doing his job either. He's kind yeah. of slacking. Yeah, he should have chopped off his cock too. <laughs> Anything with a cock is easy to fool. Who said that? Uh, it's a Gandhi. Game of Thrones line. Oh, I'm not going to say Gandhi. <laughs> <laughs> and you see one of, his, one of his mates is confronting him about Theon's wondering, how could you let a, a half-wit and a crippled boy escape? It's like, yeah, well, they escaped with the girl that you were fucking last night. Yeah, and he's like trying to act like he's an ironborn, but it's just so unnatural. <laughs> yeah. It's, and it's ironic how, like, he was, like, getting excited for the hunt. Like, oh, now you like hunting. Just wait, because I'm not sure you're going to like it when you're being hunted by Ramsey. The line where Theon says to Maester Lewin, he's like, cheer up, Maester. It, it's only a game. You could tell that for all of them, it's, it's just, it is the Game of Thrones. It's a matter of securing the Stark boys so that he has the heirs of Winterfell because they are very important to him. And it's nothing more than that. It just it is all a political game. And then Brandon Rickon head to the old farm where he sent the two orphan boys with that shepherd. And uh, Rickon, come on, man, you can't just be throwing clues everywhere. You're not really gonna help, not really helping yourself out. Oh, with the walnuts. With the walnuts. Yeah. You gotta be more, and the environment too. Actually, it's a walnut. Well, Osho questions Bran on why he just didn't have his men fight Theon. And Bran says that he didn't really want to risk their lives, but he's willing to risk the shepherd's life. But it's a decision that he made in the past really helping him out in the future. The fact that he learned from his father to look out for the small folk and then they'll do a favor like that. It's like what you said when Rob Stark is traveling throughout his army's camp and he's greeting them, he's shaking their hands, checking their gear. That's what the Starks do. They develop a rapport, a relationship with their people. So he's that very, their people will help them when they need it. And he's very conscious of that fact because, I mean, even Osha says that we should have got some food before we left. They would have gave it to you. And he said, I didn't want to put them in danger. Right. Even going to the kitchens. He didn't even want to risk that. When Theon does find the walnuts, he goes on that rant to Maester Lewin talking about how he was dragged from his home. Why should he show any mercy to the Stark children? That it's better to be cruel than to appear weak. And Maester Lewin is obviously counseling against this twofold because it's smart to keep these boys alive and healthy, and he loves them. He loves the Stark children. When you saw the final scene of this episode and you saw the two bodies hanging there, did you ever think it was Brandon Rickon? The first time I saw it, I did. 
I never did because I've been bopped by many things in the show where they've legitimately fooled me. This one never did because it seemed like they were setting up so much for Bran in terms of his magic powers and his destiny that he was going to have a bigger role. You see the two bodies and Theon's reaction to the bodies. He's very taken aback. Can't even look at that, even look at them. You know, as much as like even before when he's talking about it's better to be cruel than to be weak. Like I said before, I think he's being more ironborn like, but he's so dumb in his cruelty it comes off inorganic. Even doing something like killing two orphan boys it still gets to him because I think he still is that Theon, but he's acting like someone he's not. You know what's so funny too? Theon says when he's talking to Lewin that he's tired of being looked at as a fool or a eunuch by his people. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> a lot of callbacks here. It's like well, a lot of foreshadowing. Get ready, Theon, because you're about to be looked at. Theon, you're about to be ready. both. Yeah, not just looked. Well, at. he's already a fool, so yeah. just needed the eunuch part. But like I said, addition by subtraction. And north of the wall, we see John once again continuing his trek with Egret. And Egret's just teasing him the whole time about his virginity, asking him why he would become a member of the Night's Watch. He's, oh, you don't like girls? He's like, no, I like girls. But that's a sacrifice of being a man of the Night's Watch. It sounds and- so ridiculous <laughs> when you're like an outsider, especially a wildling. The whole time they're arguing about like what how free what freedom really is that she's actually free but john doesn't see it that way right it's that semantic argument i'm i'm a free woman i may be your prisoner but i'm free and it's interesting that the wildlings are basically a democracy he talks about well how can you consider yourself free if you follow a king named mance raider she says we chose our king and the more we learn about mance raider we learn that he didn't take power because he wanted it he really wanted to save his people and do you think at any point during their conversations talking about who owns the lands the first men or the wildlings do you think that John was ever being convinced truly to join the Wildlings? I don't think to join, but he's kind of like, it makes him think a little. Like, there's a couple moments where I think you could just see it in his face where he's like, kind of makes a point there. <laughs> they don't even know why they're fighting at this point. It's just the Wildlings are our enemies, so we fight them. And that's really it. It's as easy as saying this is land that nobody really owns. You can't claim land. We see it in our world all the time. And I keep making this point that it mirrors society. But who's to say who owns the north or south? That it's really just all a matter of conquest and who claims the land. It's ridiculous, really. And John's journey to live with the wildlings, to fight with them, it helps him understand that we need to bridge this gap. Uh, And then she bops him at the end. Yeah, the whole time she's just playing him like a fucking fool. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> well, he has no idea where he's going, and she knows the lands better than anybody. Yeah. She even mentions, like, oh, you, we're getting close, huh? It's like, yeah, we're getting close. And the look on <laughs> <laughs> when she's describing what how they're going to tell Master King Crow about that he slept with a wildling woman, she says, it's my word against yours. Now I can never marry a perfumed lord. What will my poor savage father say? Turn back around. And I thought that we were done, but he said, turn back around. <laughs> oh, by the way, before, when she's, like, rubbing up against them after they wake up, and she's like, oh, you had a knife, pull a knife on me? What's John packing with through all that leather and <laughs> layers and armor? Valyrian steel, my friend. <laughs> Valyrian steel. Six inches of snow tonight. Good for him. Fine by me. Yeah, the look on Rose Leslie's face, she's just so good with this character when she's like, should have had me when you had the chance. <laughs> just so cocky and confident. Like, yeah, you do know nothing, Jon Snow. And the first, you know nothing, Jon Snow. In yeah. this episode, her catchphrase. And it's a great picture one. like all the, the hardcore book readers before the show came out when that came on. They were like, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's like, you thing. know, when like, people like clap like in a Marvel movie because of some deep cut that, cut that happens? Yeah. In the past couple episodes, we were talking about how uh, Arya and Tywin kind of have this mutual, maybe even like each other in some weird way. But it's, I guess in this scene, we see Arya kind of contemplating killing him because they keep showing the shots of her with the knife. And they take that shot of Tywin's neck a little bit. And this is after Tywin has the mountain basically start hanging his own men, trying to figure out who tried to kill him. And it starts off nice. She gives him, gives him some mutton, which he's really a nice guy if you think about it. But then, yeah, Arya kind of, you see that contemplation, especially with the shots and, you know, of her just sitting there with a the knife in her hand. Do you think she was going to pounce? I think so. Um, and it's interesting to what Tywin is talking about here, legacy. That's really what defines Tywin's character, that he's so concerned about how he's going to be remembered after he dies and basically securing the family name that it's all about the Lannister name. It's about establishing the dynasty for the next thousand years. And, you know, I, I've thought about this too. What's going to be my legacy when I'm gone? Or what am I going to do with my life that people will remember? And it reminds me of a scene from Justice League, the cartoon, where Amazo comes back and he's looking for Lex Luthor and he's like, why did you create me? You know, what's my purpose in the world? The truth is, for all 
my struggles to make my mark in life, for all I've accomplished. In just a few short generations, my name will be forgotten. Even the greatest of us can't compete with time and death. And he brings up Aegon the Conqueror, somebody who hasn't been lost to time. Every child alive knows his name because of what he did, his conquering of Westeros, uniting the Seven Kingdoms, using Dragonfire to destroy Harrenhal. Harren and all his sons roasted alive within these walls. Aegon Targaryen changed the rules. That's why every child alive still knows his name, 300 years after his death. When Arya brings up that it wasn't just Aegon, this is such a great moment where it's Arya schooling Tywin, and I can listen to them talk history all day. Yeah, maybe I would have paid attention in class if Tywin and Arya were teaching. But Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is a great point. I love when Tywin says that Arya reminds him of Cersei, which is so ironic, because uh, your daughter's on the list, buddy. Yeah, she is. And he has that line where he says, you know, you're a student of history. Aren't more girls concerned about the fairy tales and the knights? Are most girls more interested in the pretty maidens from the songs? John Keel, flowers in her hair. Most girls are idiots. <laughs> and I think it's the first time Tywin's ever laughed in the show, and the last time. The only character to make Tywin Lannister laugh, Arya Stark, and his wife, Joanna. And yeah, when he says that Arya reminds him of Cersei, I think he's thinking of his failings as a father. Because Tywin Lannister is a great man, he's not a good man. He never had great relationships with his kids. His kids never loved him as a father. They loved him because he was their father, and they looked up to him. But they never had that relationship like Arya and Ned, or John and Ned, or Catelyn and Arya. They never had that father-child relationship that inspires loyalty, inspires love. And you know, it's funny you say that. He probably would have got that if he treated Tyrion better from Tyrion. Yeah, from all of them, really. Even Jamie. Because well, you Jamie, look at the difference between Jamie and Tywin. Jamie doesn't care about the legacy. He doesn't care about any of that. He, he's, like he said, he's a glorified bodyguard. I love here when Tywin calls her out for being highborn. It's like, eh, I got you. <laughs> yeah. You think you're slick, but. My lord. Think about that. Like, shouldn't Tywin have, like, investigated a little more? She already, he already deduced that she's a highborn northerner at that point, And you're at war with the northerners. Maybe, you know, dig around a little. I think this could be seen as a plot hole. Arya Stark is missing, and then there's a highborn girl here posing as a lowborn. This could be Arya Stark. <laughs> I know she's from the north. You know, what the hell is she doing here anyway? Why is she in the Riverlands? It doesn't make sense. I think it's, I think it's just a plot hole, but I don't, I don't mind it because these scenes are so good. If you're going to give me scenes like this, then I'll give you a plot hole. And the mountain. <laughs> Who the hell is that guy? That pisses me off. One thing that does piss me off about this show is just the constant character changes. Well, the mountain specifically. Because in season five, he's just, he looks like a 20... But it's so many. It's Mountain, Beric, Tommen, Marcella, Dario. Probably a lot more that I just can't think of right now. I'm going to write a letter. (laughs) And in King's Landing, we see Sansa thanking the Hound for saving her. The Hound just, even when somebody is trying to be nice to him, he just can't reciprocate that kindness. You talked about recasting. I wish they would have casted the Hound younger. I wish, because in the books, he's supposed to be late 20s. I think this relationship would have been more relatable if the Hound was like a younger, good-looking man, even though his, half of his face is burnt, but you can see past that, and that Sansa would look up to him as, you know, a valiant knight, but he just has all this gruff and anger. Even though I love Rory McCann, I think he plays the character beautifully, but I just wish they would have casted it more towards the books. Even though the age difference would still be weird, it's a little, yeah. it's a little harder when he looks like he's Ned's age. Right, he looks like an old man. And, and the point that he brings up... And comes back looking like he's fresh out of high school. <laughs> yeah, a big-ass high schooler, but What do you think about the point he makes about Ned Stark, that he lied about liking killing? I think that he's just trying to tell himself that to make himself feel better. We know Ned. He didn't take any joy in what he had to do, but he had to do it. I think the Hound likes it, and he tries to like convince himself that everyone else likes it, too. I'm not the weird one. You're the weird one. Right. This is just society. Society has made me this way. It's because everybody likes it. That's why I'm doing it. I'm a follower. <laughs> and he really is. That's probably the Hound's biggest flaws, that he's just willing to take orders from people he knows are in the wrong and he says Sansa one day you're gonna be thankful for all my harshness when I'm the only one standing in between you and the queen and your beloved Joffrey it's almost like he's jealous and he says that you're gonna be lucky when I'm the one standing in between you and Joffrey but then he kind of screws her over in the next scene (laughs) oh yeah yeah it's he just what what was Shay doing like you will tell no one and then just lets the girl go yeah. <laughs> like she could have just went straight to the queen anyway. Well, the dream that Sansa has too, where she's having the. Oh, yeah, the flashbacks. Yeah, of to her the attack. attack. 
you could see how that sits with her. But in the next scene, Cersei is counseling Sansa, basically saying, you're never going to love the king, but you will love his children. I'm sorry you're in this situation, but that's life. This is a nice moment, too, because it's Cersei actually giving her real advice, and it's not her just, like, blindly having Sansa say nice things about Joffrey and her making her say those things. It's like a real moment where she's like, look, I know he sucks. And we get a little bit more of that with her and Tyrion later on. She tells her that she kind of gives her own experience with Robert and tells her that you don't have to love Joffrey, but you'll love her, your children. It's almost like Tywin and Arya, where Cersei sees herself and Sansa in terms of not the personality, but the situation. It is. It's, it's the realest that these two ever get, where Cersei just lays it down saying, yes, Joffrey's terrible. I'm sorry. Buck, buck up, kid, because... Love no one but your children. On that front, a mother has no choice. Shouldn't I love Joffrey, Your Grace? You can try, little dove. The scene with Cersei and Tyrion—it's—it's it's such a sad scene because it's the closest that these two ever get to being brother and sister, to even being friends. Um, and Cersei's talking about how she cannot control Joffrey, and she and she breaks down in this scene. Yeah, it's her realization. Well, I guess she's always known, but probably the first time she's ever talked about it to somebody about Joffrey and how much of a sicko he is. Yeah, and she's open about her relationship with Jamie as well. Yeah, Tyrion tells her that she beats the odds with Tom and Marcella are decent people and they kind of it's like the most awkward moment of comfort shared between two people yeah <laughs> i've ever seen in my life it's you think that Tyrion's gonna go up to her maybe put a hand on her shoulder possibly even hug her but they can't yeah because in that moment cersei realizes what an asshole she's always been to Tyrion, and Tyrion realizes that <laughs> cersei's always been an asshole why am i gonna comfort her it can't happen and it's it's sad you know you wish that these two characters would be able to embrace each other it's the closest they ever got to being siblings Well, even in that scene, uh, they say, uh, flip a coin, right? Every time a Targaryen is born. I think it kind of landed on, like, the edge with Daenerys. First see Daenerys in this uh, episode, she's talking with Zaro. Basically, he keeps, like, giving her the same spiel over and over again. And she's like, look, enough, guy. Yeah, Get I away from me, you freak. I don't care where you came from, dude. He's always saying that. Yeah, I came from... Yeah, I got it. I've seen the last couple yeah, of episodes. Look at my vaults. Like, what if she took her up on that? All right, yeah, show me your vaults. Uh, no, no, I could do that later. Oh, uh, later. that. <laughs> That's my vault for the vault. If you open it, it's just going to be another vault. And then she has a moment with Jorah, where Jorah returns when he hears like, about the dragons. It's like Peter Griffin's uh, porn vault in his house when Laura Lois <laughs> goes to the grocery Mrs. Place. Griffin out today? Shopping. <laughs> and when Jorah returns after he hears about the dragons, this scene too, it's Daenerys, it's, she's not pushing Jorah away, but she's in such a bad place at this moment because her dragons are lost that even when Jorah tries to comfort her, she says, you're too familiar. And it's strange that she's being so aggressive towards somebody who is clearly on her side. And Jorah says that to her. Nobody in this world can survive without help. She says, go find my dragons then. It's like, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I, I guess I'll do that. And the scene with Quaith, once again, Quaith is almost like omnipresent, that she knows the history about everybody because of the power with her magic that she's using the glass candles to see through time. Uh, she could be a green seer as well. And she even has the moment where she's painting blood on the traveler who's going to sail near the doom of Valyria and she's saying oh you know if you sail near the doom you'll need protection and she confronts him about his loyalty yeah, maybe he needed that protection when he became a stone man yeah and Jorah's kind of like taken aback in that moment about like oh shit she knows her shit but then he gives a stern never it's like alright I know I messed up in the past but I'll never let it happen again she believes him because she tells him well in a riddle she couldn't just be like oh it's this guy she's like oh no she's with him now alluding to obviously Zaro and Pirate Pri who they're talking to with the meeting of the Thirteen and we got our boy Spice King. I love how he talks, too, with his hands. He's always yeah. like... I really enjoy this character and the actor. The Spice because King. he's very logical. Like, if I knew where your dragons are, I would not tell you. <laughs> yeah, he has his little hand hand gesture, right? Yeah, and it's the coup d'etat that Payat Pri and Zaro perform on the 13. And it's inter- It's an interesting idea. It's almost like Quarth is Wakanda, that they don't want to open their doors or their walls to any new people or ideas. And Zaro wants to open Quarth to the world. Payat Pri and the Warlocks of Karth, they kidnap Daenerys' dragons just to use them on their own, right? And their idea is that if they have Daenerys, then we can train them to be powerful. Because well, their, I, their magic is, it's, they're like the alchemists. Yeah, the, war, the Warlocks, they're 
power grows with the birth of the dragons. Right, so right. The closer they are to them, the more the more power they have with their magic. At first, when I saw this, the first time I watched the show, I'm like, oh, they're helping her out. Good looks. This is like a nightmare for me. You know, being in a situation where you kill one of them and then you turn the corner and another one's right there. Yeah, that shit's fucking freaky. This guy, <laughs> pre man, he's a, he's a weird looking guy. Yeah. He's like somebody that would haunt my nightmares. He like talks if, weird too, man. Like if you open your bedroom when you came home and you see Piat Pri standing there. Oh, I'm fucking out. It's, oh my God. The Ooh. House of the Undying is next episode? Yeah. Or the finale? No, it's Ooh. the finale. Okay. And Rob's army in the Westerlands. This is funny too when you see all of his lords leave him and Talissa comes into the tent to talk with Rob that Roos Bolton is kind of looking over her shoulder to see if Rob closes the maps. It's not there yet, but they're starting to distrust Rob and the power that he holds. They don't feel that he's putting the North in front of his own personal agenda. Yeah, you can tell there's like a slight rift in a Northern camp. They ring up like there's too many prisoners. There's nowhere to put the Lannister. And the way that he treats the messenger, Alton Lannister, who's delivering the terms between the Lannisters and the Starks, that he wants to keep him in a, in a pretty decent prison cell. Yeah, and also, you know, with her treating not only the northern men, but her en- the enemies as well. And he says, oh, I've heard that from my ban- bannermen too many times, something like that. So you could tell this beginning of a slight riff within the northern ranks. And what do you think about this scene between Jamie and his cousin? I think this is one of the best Jamie scenes of the whole show. Do you like that change? Because in the book, the Frey cousin... I do like this be- change. ...goes with him and Brienne. Because when Jamie returns to Cersei and he says, I've killed, this is the scene that always sticks with me. Because it's, it's, it's the two sides to Jamie. He can, have the, he can share the perspective of somebody who's not as high up on the totem pole as he is. And he can bond with his cousin. And then it's like, in order for me to escape, I have to kill you. <laughs> it's that gray, man. He is the Machiavellian adventurer in, in Westeros. With the book, the way they play it out that way, you can always... I always argue that Jamie was always this way. It's just that the circumstances that we see him and he's put in in the earlier seasons, kind of it's kind of hard to see it. But this one is kind of like the first real evil thing he's done. I mean, you could say, yeah, throwing Bran out the window, but in that moment he's trying to protect his family and his, his love, Cersei, and his children. This one's kind of like, yeah, you just murdered your cousin with uh, and choked him to death. Yeah, but he's doing it to try and escape. Yeah, but he escapes in the book without... Yeah, well, his cousin. You talk about how the show is always protecting Jamie. They're not doing it here. I guess. No, I, I don't hate it. I'm just saying. There's I think just... it makes it more powerful to me the the attempted escape because it's not in a he didn't escape. He gets recaptured and he he also kills Rickard Rickard Carr Stark's son, Torn Stark, the man who was keeping watch over the the cells. But to talk about Torn Carr Stark, Torn Carr Stark, right? Thinking this guy's the last king of the North. Yeah. Huh? But the story, you know, to hear the, hear um the story from Alton Lannister's perspective about squiring for Jamie that it was the best moment of his life, where you think it's kind of sad almost, it's a bit pathetic, and that he says that he didn't even want to go back to his family where they were at the feast that because they were sitting so far away from the from the bride and groom. Jamie has a similar story where he talks about how he squired for Barrison, and it's a nice moment between these two cousins. And then Jamie gets recaptured uh, right here. You can mark as the beginning of the end for Rob. You can just tell the car Stark, car Stark wants his revenge, and Kat does everything she can to keep him at bay for now, and there's a friction among the ranks. People are arguing with each other, fighting with each other on whether they should let car Stark get his revenge, or no, we have to listen to Rob. Rob's our king. Cat realizes, like, yeah, I need to make my move now, or Sansa and Arya could pay the price. It's funny because Catelyn and car Stark want to make the same mistake, because Catelyn ultimately does make the mistake by freeing Jaime. She's fooled by Tyrion, thinking that somehow this is going to get her daughters back. But car Stark wants to do the same thing, that he's not going to put the war ahead of his own personal feelings, that he wants revenge on Jaime Lannister, but he doesn't... He doesn't take a moment to realize that if he kills Jamie, that severely weakens their position because then it's all out war. And I think the best move would just be keep him as a prisoner and Rob just had the promise. Like, look, Jamie's here. We'll get to it eventually. But right now we have to fight a war and my sisters. But kind of that revenge blocking your judgment because they're not going to wait for Rob to come back. They're going to act that night. Right. And what do you think about the scene between Catelyn and Jamie? Those are some of the couple of the best interactions of the season, Jamie and uh, Catelyn. When Catelyn confronts Jamie about forsaking every vow that he's ever took, one of the most iconic lines when he's talking about how one way or another you're forsaking one vow, you know, protect the king, be loyal to your father, protect the innocent, protect the weak, but what happens when your father despises the king? What happens when the king slaughters the innocent? And you think that's why the hound never took those vows. That's why the hound remains, he's not a knight, because he can never be accused of forsaking the vow, because he knows one way or the other you're going to forsake them. 
Yeah, he absolutely just goes for the fucking kill on this one. He talks about how he must hate the bastard uh, John when Ned brought back some whore's son, and he's a walking, talking reminder of his betrayal. He's like, a how walking, are you going to call- walking, talking reminder that Ned Stark fucked another woman. The way yeah. he delivers that, he knows he's going to die. It's like, I'm are you talking on- to me about honor? Check yeah. yourself. Yeah, and he says, I'm more honorable than most people alive. I've only been with one woman. <laughs> She's my sister, but you know how it is between us Lannisters. It's the moment that Catelyn decides to free Jaime. And it's cool because in the book, we don't know what happened with Jaime until Storm of Swords. It's the first chapter. It's the Jaime perspective that he can't believe that Catelyn let him free. He's like, oh my God, she's an idiot. Uh, hopefully I get back in one piece. And it's the beginning of the adventures between Jaime and Brienne. Yeah, and really the turn for Jaime as well. So what would you give this episode out of 10? I really like this episode a lot. I'd probably give it a nine and a half. Nine and a half. Wow. Really good episode. I, I, I like the moments. I love the Cersei and Jamie stuff. So much happening. It's the beginning of the end of Rob, the beginning of John and Egret's relationship. When looking back on it after knowing how everything ends, this is like a very important episode. Yeah, I give it a 10 out of 10. Oh, wow. Why, why'd you be surprised when I gave it a high score and you gave it a 10? Because you're, you're a low baller. I'm not a low baller. Yeah, you, you've turned into Teddy. Well, Teddy, just if I low ball, people are like, oh, what does he know that I don't? Not much. <laughs> Hey guys, thank you for watching this video, and before we go, I want to quickly thank our Patreon supporters. Without your support, we wouldn't be able to grow and evolve as a channel, so thank you for your generous pledges. If you are interested in supporting our channel through Patreon, visit www.patreon.com nerdsoup, and you can see the different rewards we offer to our Patreon supporters. T-shirts, mugs, stickers, access to our behind-the-scenes video, and more. Thanks again for watching this video, and make sure you like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Or dislike, don't share, and unsubscribe. It's a binary world, folks.